Hello and welcome. My name is B. Chatfield and I'm a landscape architect and project manager with Boston Parks and Recreation. And tonight is our first community meeting for Copley Square. So welcome. I wanna let you all know that this meeting is being recorded so that we can post it on our project website. And so the people who can't be here tonight can see it later on. And it should be up on the website within one week. We'll be showing you our presentation first, and then at the end, we will have discussion where we respond to your questions. This meeting has two ways to interact. We're showing the directions on your screen if you're joining us on a computer. For anybody joining us by phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand, and then we'll call on you in the order that you raised your hand. You'll then be allowed to unmute yourself, which you do by pressing star six. I wanna welcome everyone here tonight but especially if I would like to welcome our elected officials. If there are any electeds here tonight, please click the raise hand button now and we will unmute you and you can introduce yourself. Are there any electeds? Not yet, okay. All right, we'll welcome them as they come, I guess. So let's have the next slide, please. So here we are at our agenda tonight. Um, we're gonna start with the project overview where I go over our goals, introduce our team and our timeline. Then our design team will present their site analysis. First, they'll review the history and the context of the square. And then they'll go into how to understand the square, its programming, its events, its physical attributes and condition, and its feeling and its character. After the presentation, we're going to open it up for discussion and listen to your thoughts and respond to your questions. Lastly, we'll explain what our next steps will be so that you can attend our future meetings and understand our process. Next slide. So here we have our project team. On the left, we've got Boston Parks and Recreation. And on the right, we have Sasaki. Sasaki is a world-renowned design firm that is based right here in the Boston area. And we are thrilled to be working with them for this project. We've got Kate Took here tonight, Zach Crisco, Radhika Mahan, Kevin Hebbard, Kira Sargent, and Julian Osorio. They also have a very deep bench of fantastic consultants that they're working with. And we have all confidence that whatever direction this project goes in, they're going to have people there on board who can help with the design. On the left of the project, sort of the project team, we've got me, I'm B. Chatfield, the project manager. There's my contact information working with Liza Meyer, our chief landscape architect, and Christine Brandeo, who is our outreach coordinator. There's her contact information as well. We're working with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services, the Boston Planning and Development Agency as well, and the Public Facilities Department. Um, we are aware of the Boston Public Library project, their planning effort to reconceive their Dartmouth Street entrance, and we are working with them on this. We feel strongly that the library and the square should work together as one public space so our design teams are talking and we'll be sharing public meetings once we get into our schematic design process so let's move on to schedule all right we have our phase one site analysis which is where we are right now this is our first public meeting where we come to you and we say this is what we've sort of assessed in the square and we want you to tell us how you use it what you think what your thoughts are, where this should go. We're then going to come back to the public with phase two, sort of concept options and say, here's some thoughts, this is what we've been thinking, what do you like of each of these options? And then we have meeting three, which will occur probably sometime early spring 2021, where we have a refined concept plan and we say, this is what we heard, did we get it right? At that point, if the answer is yes, we move forward with our phase three definitive design, where we basically transform our schematic plan developed in phase two into contract documents. So essentially we're looking at a design process that's going to be happening throughout 2021 and then a construction process that will be throughout 2022. Next slide, please. So here we have the design process that we sort of go through here at Parks. I like to sort of think of this as a little bit of a recipe with sort of four main ingredients and the star chef is the design team. 
We've got community input, which is what we're doing here now in our next two community meetings, where we try to engage as many people as possible and hear as many voices as possible. And we also balance that with the city of Boston priorities, where we try and make spaces that are accessible and available to all, create spaces that have a diverse, balanced and efficient mix of uses, create meaningful and inclusive community engagement processes and adaptive and resilient landscapes that promote connections. And that's not just connections between spaces, but it's connections between people, connections between people in their city as well. At Parks and Recreation, our goals specifically are expanding walkable access to parks, which the city of Boston already does a fantastic job doing, but we're always trying to improve that. Addressing equity, trying to address neighborhoods that perhaps haven't had a new park in a long time, trying to target those areas specifically. Improving our climate resilience, the health of our citizens, and building communities as well. If you add all of that to safety and regulatory guidelines, you have a large list of things to try and incorporate. So then we talk to our design team who've been part of this process the whole time and they take their innovative design talents and their quality construction experience and create a fantastic public park. Next slide, please. So we have a number of projects that Parks is working on um, that is in the neighborhood. We have the Clarendon Tot Lot nearby that plans on holding its first community meeting in December. We have the renovation of Titus Sparrow Park that's ongoing. The lagoon in the public garden is happening as well and the Boston Common Master Plan will release its report in spring of 2021. So the next slide, please. So as a city, we ask a lot of Copley Square. Once a year, it serves as a home base for the marathon and weekly it transforms into a marketplace for the largest farmer's market in Boston. It also hosts protests and book fairs, it serves as a meeting point, a public notification about local arts and performances, and it is the foreground of some of Boston's well, best known architecture. This project that we're about to undertake is about making this park work for the current and future needs of our city. As we've seen in the last year, outdoor spaces are more and more important to our sanity and health. This is great for our parks, but the obvious challenge is how do we keep up? One can see the various aspects of the square suffering from use. Pavement is cracking, trees have suffered, and the lawn gets trampled. We need to upgrade it so it can better serve our needs today and tomorrow. We're holding this meeting to hear what you have to say. We want to hear what our priorities should be. Why do you visit this park? Or why don't you? What do you think needs to happen here? And with that, I would like to turn it over to our design team. Thanks so much, B. Um, my name is Kate Took. I'm a landscape architect and principal with Sasaki. We are really thrilled to be here tonight. I'm joined by several colleagues whose voices you will hear throughout the course of this presentation. Um, as B mentioned, we're a local practice, um, but we practice internationally um, and really specialize in civic spaces, just like Copley Square um, all around the country. So as B mentioned, this is the first of three different public meetings where we'll bring our thoughts to you um, and ask you to share your thoughts with us. Um, we're really here tonight to listen. And we're gonna share a lot of information with you about what we've learned so far about Copley Square. And we're gonna ask you a lot of questions. Um, and our hope really is that you all learn a little bit about Copley's history as well as its current condition. And you, that you have an opportunity to share your perspective about what the square means to you today and what you can imagine for the future. Um, all of this is gonna build a really nice foundation for the design team to come back to you in the winter with conceptual options for the square's future. So um, we invite you to engage with us in a number of ways throughout the course of this presentation. If at any point you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A window of the webinar, um, Zoom webinar experience. Um, throughout the course of the presentation, we are going to ask you to participate in live polling. And you can do so either by using your mobile phone, texting 22333 to Sasaki Polls just once to join, and then you can answer the questions. Or you can also use a web device. Uh, so you can navigate to pollev.com slash Sasaki Polls and follow the prompts on the screen. If at any point you don't want to answer the questions or aren't interested in participating in a live manner with us tonight, all the same questions as well as more questions are available in an online survey. And this link will be at the end of the presentation as well. Um, 
So with that, we want to start just with an icebreaker question. We know that there are a number of you on the line tonight, and we're curious to know a little bit about how often you visit Copley Square. Um, is this a place that you come daily, weekly, monthly, just occasionally, uh, once a year maybe, um, or have you never been to the square at all? Um, so again, you can text Sasaki Polls once to 22333. And then you text A, B, C, D, or E to give us your answer. So it looks like so far 12 people have responded. Um, definitely occasionally is coming through most of all. So those are folks um, that are saying that they have been there, um, you know, once a year, every now and then, um, but not frequent users. So look, the daily users are coming, coming into the forefront now, daily and weekly users. Um, a wide variety of you all. Um, so I, we have 16 entrants, 17. Um, I'm going to give it just a moment more while we see um, if anyone else can text in to join the poll. There will be many opportunities throughout the course of this presentation to share your opinion. So this is just the first opportunity. Interesting. So more weekly users now. Um, the interesting thing about this question for us, I think, is that there are many of you that may have used Copley Square daily or weekly before COVID um, and maybe using it a little bit less in the last nine months or so. Um, so we're aware of that change and I think interested in hearing tonight about how that change um, may play out in the future in your minds. Um, so lots of weekly users. I think it's interesting if you add up daily, weekly, and monthly users, we have um, much more, much more than half of the participants um, really using the square pretty regularly. Um, so Radhika, let's move on. There'll be more opportunities to participate. Thank you. Um, so first off, we're, we're curious about the history of the square. And I think um, we understand that there are a lot of people in the city of Boston who are real Boston history buffs. So this is not an exhaustive history of Boston or the Back Bay, but we've really been asking the question, what can the history of this space of Copley Square and its surroundings tell us about its future needs, about what it's doing today and what it wants to be in the future? So very briefly, um, I think it's, it's worth knowing that um, when, when Boston was beginning to fill in the Back Bay in the late 1800s, there was a movement among planners of Boston that there be a hub of activity in Back Bay, which would be a, an art square flanked by the city's really most important cultural institutions of the time. So three of those institutions still stand and flank the square today, Boston Public Library, the Old South Church at the corner, and Trinity Church really standing proud in the square. One of those institutions, uh, many people don't know, the original home of the Museum of Fine Arts was, was the um, framing piece of the square along St. James, where the um, Fairmount Copley Plaza Hotel stands today. Um, but that building um, was once a really important part of framing the square. So over the course of history, the square has taken a number of different forms. Um, interestingly, for the first um, several decades, it was really actually a series of two triangles bisected by Huntington Avenue, um, which was a busy avenue at the time by the 1960s. It was um, handling a large volume of traffic as well as streetcars. And those squares, which were grassy, um, were underutilized. So the original idea of a square flanked by cultural institutions wasn't really coming forward in the 1960s. So the city held a design competition and asked international design firms to reimagine the square. Sasaki, among a number of other firms, responded, and Sasaki's um, original design was, was chosen. Um, the transformation that happened here really um, removed Huntington Avenue from the square, enabled it to be a square rather than a series of triangles, set a framing device for Trinity Church, gave it really a real a platform and a majesty, um, but it was sunken well below the, the surrounding streets and it was very paved. And after about 20 years, I think this um, icon of mid-century modern style um, was not working for the city for a variety of reasons. So in the 1980s, the city held another design competition, which resulted in the square that you see today, which responded to the square of the mid-century modern style by adding significantly more green space and raising the square to be level with the, the platform of the surrounding streets. Um, so this is the square that we know and love today. So B asked the question, you know, why today? Um, and I think the answer really is exactly as B stated, that we have a much loved square um, that we're asking an awful lot of. 
And asking an awful lot of the square means that um, there are a number of systems that are really in need of upgrade. The trees are a little bit stressed. The lawn is a little bit stressed. The fountain um, is in need of upgrades and repairs. The pavements are in need of upgrades and repairs. Um, so the result is that the Parks Department is thinking forward. What can we do um, to ensure that we have this much loved city square and we upgrade it to 21st century standards? Now, um, a wide variety of Bostonians use this square, and that's why this is su such an important question. Um, Copley Square is a square that serves the entire city, as well as the tourist population. Um, it's a square that serves young and old, people of all mobilities, everyone from local residents and professionals um, to tourists, to those who are drawn for shopping and events, um, who, or who visit casually for fitness classes and, and walking their dogs. This is a square for all. And it needs to, to function that way moving into the future as well. So our next question for you is actually um, about which of these user types do you actually most identify with? Um, so if you, um, you get to choose up to three answers here when you text in your reply, um, and you can state whether you're a local resident, a passerby, a library visitor, a tourist, a local professional, a member of the homeless community or a skateboarder, um, major event attendee, uh, member of the church community, or you attend fitness classes, or whether perhaps you walk your dog casually in this area. Um, so I'm just going to jump to in while um, people are filling out the poll to let everybody know that the polling is completely optional. This is just a fun thing to be able to do if, if you're comfortable doing so. At the top of the screen, um, it explains how to join the polling app. Um, so you would text um, 22333 as the phone number um, and then write in Sasaki polls in the message and that will connect you, connect you with this polling. Um, if that doesn't work for you or you're having trouble with it, we will be asking all these same questions in an online survey that's available after this meeting tonight. So you can certainly provide your input that way um, this is just a fun way to be able to do it during the meeting if it works, um, but it's not the only way to give us input by any means. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liza. That is absolutely true. So I see that uh, uh, this, is, this question is eliciting quite a bit of response, um, and I see that there are an, a wide variety of local residents with us tonight. Um, over you know, a quarter of you all are identifying as a local resident. Um, library visitors, um, I see professionals as well represented, um, folks attending events, passing by, commuting. Um, and I think I'm intrigued by how many other uses there are appearing tonight. And I think um, if, if there are those of you that can you know, type into the chat or um, let us know when we open up for Q&A what some of those other uses are that we're missing, that would be um, really wonderful. Okay, so if you've missed your opportunity to participate, as Liza said, all of this is available um, on our online survey. So we're gonna move on. Um, and my colleague Kira is gonna jump in to talk a little bit about current programming on the square. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, so now we're gonna take a look at programming, trying to understand how Copley Square is used today on a daily, weekly, and weekly basis and for large events. Starting with daily events, we know that every day Copley Square has a lot going on with some activities changing throughout the year like the fountain and others staying pretty constant like commuters. So now we're looking at a plan of Copley Square. You can see Trinity on the right, Trinity Church on the right and Dartmouth Street in the library on the left. Um, and we're showing how activity looks across the site. The square is, as I said, really heavily used by commuters. There are five bus and subway stops within just one block, including two on the square itself. And that's not even to mention Back Bay Station, which is a little up Dartmouth Street. So foot traffic is definitely the heaviest along Dartmouth Street and Boylston. There's also a lot of cross traffic throughout the square from the, the three major intersections going to the 200 Clarendon Hancock building. People throughout the square are using the benches and the lawns for relaxing, getting together, dog walking, and the fountain is a really big attraction, primarily in the summer with children and families and the lunch crowd and others. 
Um, so next, every week there are slightly larger uses of gather, you know, group gatherings, including the farmer's market, performances, and exercise classes. Over the last few years, we've even seen several large rallies and protests, which are obviously more spontaneous. Um, looking at the layout of these events, the farmer's market definitely has the biggest and most consistent impact. It occurs twice a week from May to November, which is six months of the year, so half the year. Pre-COVID, it was laid out along the sidewalks, which means that the sidewalks have to support the trucks for setup and takedown of the farmer's market too. There are other events like exercise classes, which often take place on the lawn. And then there are small performances, activities, tour groups, classes that are on the plaza. Of course, um, as you're well aware, next, next slide. As you're well aware, there are large events, large annual events like the marathon and first night. And while these are a key part of Copley's Place in Boston, they also put really heavy demands on the square. We'll look at the marathon and first night more in a second. Um, there are also large concerts like the Summer Arts Festival. There are um, large group gatherings like the Boston Book Fest and crowds from the parades like the sports championships and the Pride Parade, which run along Boylston. Looking at the marathon layout, we see that it brings an immense amount of equipment and people to the site. There are two very large tents, one on Dartmouth Street, which is closed, and one on the main lawn. Event vehicle, trucks, and trailers are parked throughout the square. And there are other support needs like restrooms and sponsor tents. This whole setup lasts for over two weeks each April and is followed by the need to replace the entire lawn. First night is similar in terms of the pedestrian and vehicle traffic on the square. We see lots of people, trucks, trailers, and the closing off of Dartmouth Street. Key features of, um, of the event include the ice sculptures, which really draw people onto the lawn, and then a large stage in front of Trinity. In the past few years, First Night has brought hundreds of thousands of people to this area in just two days. So programs like First Night and the Marathon, these large events, they, they do feel unique to Copley, but Copley also exists in a larger network of these complementary park amenities. Within a five minute walk, there are two playgrounds. Within 10 minutes, there are gardens like the, like, um, the public garden. Within 15 minutes, there are basketball courts, tennis courts, sports fields, and there are even two other major events event spaces for the city, the parade ground, and um, the hat shell. So this means that when we think about what kind of programming and what we want to provide at Copley, we don't need to provide everything. We can focus on what is going to be special for this place and how Copley can be a hub for this larger network of parks. Um, next, we're gonna go back to Kate for a few questions. Yeah, so we're curious now um, what you all think are the most successful events and activities on the square. Um, so for this, you can text your response as a single word with no spaces, and it'll appear um, as part of a word cloud that we can all start to see. If you see an, an answer you like, you can text that again, and it will get a little bit bigger. So we know that there are many people um, that are interested in that event in particular. So I think Christmas tree lighting um, is coming forward, marathon in the farmer's market. I see in many ways farmer's market, first night, the jazz festival, Boston jazz, um, folks interested in skateboarding, um, the passive opportunities on the park becoming something that are, that's, I see. Um, Yep, the Jimmy, something about the Jimmy Fund I see. Again, a reminder to text them as one word um, with no spaces and that'll ensure that your idea remains um, together. Um, and again, if, if your idea is not popping up, you can enter, you can go to the survey um, and, and again, tell us a little bit more about what you are thinking um, of this. Um, but it's interesting, I see the farmer's market really coming out clearly, concerts, the arts kiosk, um, the Boston Book Fair, 
Um, so these are, these are events that are known and loved throughout all of Boston and really draw a wide variety of Bostonians and tourists alike to the heart of the city and to Copley Square. I'll give it just a moment more. I do see dog walking coming in there. Um, several opportunities for fair, one-off events. Um, something about Adidas Boston games, interesting. Um, so yeah, I think as the design team, this is exciting. There are a couple of things here that we haven't um, heard too much about yet. Um, and so I think it'll be great to hear more from folks in the survey as well as in the discussion about what, what you're seeing and why these things are successful. So uh, Kira said there are a number of things that make it, um, all these beloved events actually cause a lot of um, stress and pressure on the square. We ask a lot of Copley Square to host all of these events. So our next question for you is about um, what you see as the top concerns with uh, activities on the square. Um, and you can choose up to three of these answers. Um, and this, this answer is meant to be, reflect your opinion pre-COVID-19. Um, so what are your top concerns? Is it noise? Is it damage to site features, overcrowding, vandalism, littering and mess, the traffic impact, parking concerns, disruption of ordinary uses like sitting on benches or walking dogs, fitness classes, um, or something else that we haven't um, offered as an opportunity for, for answer. Interesting. So I'm seeing a lot of concern from folks on the line about damage to site features. Um, so things that um, things like the damage to the lawn annually that Kira was referencing, as well as damage to pavements or benches due to those events. Um, littering and mass and vandalism also top concerns. Um, so again, I think um, I think what we're hearing from you all tonight is that um, it's it's some of those lasting impacts on the physical plant of the site that are really most important and coming forward most for you all, um, as well as a couple of auxiliary concerns about impact on the neighborhood, parking and um, traffic. Okay, so we have one last question for you in this section. I think we're curious, you know, knowing the different kinds of um, opportunities on the square currently, um, we're curious what kinds of programs and activities would you most like to see the square host in the future? Um, we've provided a list full of things that currently are on the square, fitness classes, the farmer's market, passive fountain opportunities, um, the opportunity for something a little more active or interactive in terms of the fountain, gardens and planting, public art, concerts and cultural events, celebrations and protests, skate friendly features, food trucks or push cart vendors, or a permanent pavilion and cafe. Um, so I see lots of answers coming up here. We, again, you can choose up to three answers, three of your top favorites. Um, so clearly the farmer's market is a really popular element. Um, that aligns well with the, the fact that many of you are local residents um, and passers-by. We remember that you answered that. And so I think there are a lot of people that are using that farmer's market on a regular basis. Um, lots of interest in public art, um, which actually aligns really nicely with the city's um, long-standing understanding of this as the city's art square. Um, so it's nice to see that coming through. Um, concerts and cultural events and gardens and planting, these being um, things that really feel right um, for folks. And a permanent pavilion and cafe coming up um, is something that folks are interested in. Also quite a bit of interest in a splash pad or interactive fountain. Okay. Thank you all. This is really insightful information. Again, I think we're, we're going to be um, using this information. You have opportunities to tell us more about your answers by going to the online survey or also to tell us more in the question and answer period. Um, so we're going to move on to the next section of analysis, which is about the square's physical condition. Radhika. Thanks, Kate. Um, as you have seen, uh, Copley Square hosts a variety of events at different scales, and these uses directly impact the physical condition of the square. We would like to understand how Copley Square is performing, specifically with the planting, the paving, and the fountain. Uh, within the natural landscape elements of Copley Square, we're looking at the trees, lawns, ornamental planting beds, the microclimate, and the ratio of paved and unpaved areas. 
we have an arborist on the team, Bartlett Tree Experts, and they have evaluated the condition of the 56 trees on site. Uh, as you can see, uh, over half of them are in good condition, whereas the remaining trees are uh, in fair or poor condition. These trees are colored coded in the plan where the trees that are in good condition are shown in green and the trees that are in poor or fair condition are shown in orange or red. Mm -hmm. As the pro project progresses, Bartlett will continue to help us understand the uh, design impact on the health of the trees. Urban areas generally lean towards having harsh microclimates, both for paving and planting, and Copley Square is no different. There are areas of deep shade and intense sun, and the surrounding urban grid channels the wind through the square. Uh, and finally, looking at the ratio of the paved area to unpaved area, uh, about 30% of the site is uh, unpaved, which allows the stormwater to soak into the ground and the remaining nearly 70% is paved, which does not allow the water to soak in through to the ground. So the next slide shows some images of the existing conditions. As you can see, the lawn is heavily used and is replaced annually. And the trees require a fair amount of maintenance, which is performed both by the Parks Department and the Friends of Copley Group. Looking at the paving within, the, within Copley Square, there are a variety of paving patterns and materials within the square, which lend themselves to the iconic character of Copley Square. When the square was built in the 1980s, the design didn't anticipate the kind of heavy uses um, that happen on Copley Square today. And the vehicular loading over time has caused the settlement of pavers leading to non-ADA accessible paving within the square. Uh, we know that the fountain is an important civic amenity. We heard that the fountain is a place where you meet people at Copley Square where friends meet to get lunch or hang out and everyone knows the fountain. We've uh, also learned that the fountain mechanical equipment is at the end of its life and it needs to be updated. When the fountain is dry, it invites skateboarders and over time, this has caused damage to the masonry. So looking ahead, we are trying to find a balance between the programming functions that help make Copley Square a successful civic space and the material and planting choices that will help run and support these uses and events. With that, I will hand over to Kate for questions. So sorry, our question here is really, um, what should be the priority of this renovation? Um, as we look ahead, should, should Parks and the design team be contemplating upgrading the existing square as is, upgrading it with some redesign of its spaces? That means reconsideration of how much lawn, how much paving, where the trees are, um, or should we be really completely reimagining the square um, in the context of its of its 21st century use? Um, so I see about 24 people have responded so far. Um, a majority of folks are asking to completely reimagine the square, really rethink um, what it looks and feels like. Um, and then there is definitely quite a bit of interest in upgrading the existing square with a little bit of redesign. Um, so that's coming through pretty clearly. 28 responses. So that's really helpful. I think um, our next question for you all in the context of that is, what should be the highest priorities in, in terms of thinking about um, physical improvements to the square? Um, I think we're, we're curious to know whether um, enhancing and sustaining the tree canopy is most important to you, improving or updating the fountain, improving the lawn, improving the pavements, um, bringing them into ADA compliance, for example upgrading the lighting, updating benches and seating opportunities, and providing better infrastructure connections for different kinds of events. Um, so that means that rather than bringing a generator for a specific event, the, the square might actually just allow for plugging in um, for those kinds of events. Um, so I see lots of activity on this poll. Um, a, a really broad range of things that you all think are priorities. You can choose up to three here. So I see a lot of people really interested in enhancing and sustaining that tree canopy. 
Um, this is an important green space in the heart of Back Bay, um, one of the city's more developed and densely settled areas. Um, and so that tree canopy is a really important part of the city's efforts to green the city. Um, updating benches and seating opportunities also coming out really strongly here. Um, so there are a number of benches already, um, but providing um, more variety potentially in the way people can sit, improving and updating the fountain and better infrastructure all coming through really clearly. Um, thank you all. This will really be important for helping us to set priorities about what we address first and how we think about the renovation. Um, so finally, we have a category of analysis that really focuses on the square's character. Um, and character is really meant to encompass two things. How does Copley Square feel when you're there? Um, and what's its main aesthetic and identity? Um, so this is a little bit more of a nebulous question than the, than the two we've answered about programming and about the physical condition. Um, so we've provided three different lenses um, to think first about what Copley Square is. Um, really, it's a, it's a palimpsest. It's a many different things to many different people. Um, so at times, it can be an active and social gathering place. These are the kinds of events that Kira spoke about, um, the big gatherings, the protests, the celebrations, the cultural events. Um, at other times of, of day and night and season, it's really a restful and peaceful place. It's a place where you come to get away from the city. Next slide, please, Radhika. Um, it's a place where you come to get away from the hustle and bustle of the traffic of the surrounding streets, a place to relax with just one or two people, uh, to have a quiet lunch, to have a quiet conversation, uh, to enjoy planting, um, and really take a breath in the middle of a busy urban day. Um, and finally, I think Copley Square has long been an iconic part of the Boston experience. It's not a historic square, um, but it's surrounded by history. And it, it uses a number of really important materials. Um, and it has a context in the city with surrounded by historic buildings that really make it an important part of the tourist stop, as well as a part of the city that really defines what Boston is with its brick textures, um, and its tree canopy, um, and its really um, stately architecture. So that said, um, Copley Square is, is really a space that is many things to many people at many different times of day. Um, it provides those classic views of Boston's Back Bay in many different places throughout the square. It has four really important monuments and sculptures, everything from the uh, Boston Marathon 100 year, annual, um, 100 year commemoration to the John Singleton Copley statue and the tortoise and hare statues, which are really important pieces. It has iconic paving throughout, which you can see in the red hatched zones of this. Um, and then it has many spaces that are shady and passive and quiet versus open and windy. Again, it has many different kinds of spaces depending on, on what kind of space you're looking for in the city. So it's many things. So to understand this, the opportunities better, um, we put Copley Square in the context of a number of different uh, squares and open spaces within the city of Boston and elsewhere that can help us understand what the opportunities are and which direction Copley Square should, should go in in the future. Um, so you can see that Copley Square is sitting in sort of the middle of this diagram. It's about halfway between um, a mostly paved space and a mostly green space. And it's about halfway between a really quiet and reflective space that supports small groups and a much more active and social space that that encourages large groups and larger crowds. We've clustered a number of different case studies um, that fall in different parts of this spectrum from the public garden, which you all know um, to be a very green space, very passive space, all the way up to Pioneer Courthouse Square in Portland, Oregon, which is a very paved space, which really encourages large active gatherings. So we've pulled four of these. We wanna just talk a little bit about what, what opportunities they show um, and then ask you some questions about them. So the first we've looked at is Post Office Square. The diagram on the left shows Post Office Square is about 200 by 385 feet. The dashed red line shows the outline in the same scale of Copley Square. So you can see that Post Office Square and Copley Square are pretty much the same size. Post Office Square is an urban square that is very quiet and passive and interior facing. It has quite a bit of pavement, but that pavement is distributed throughout and really focused around a central green lawn. This is a place that shelters you from the traffic. It turns inward. It's a quiet respite from the city. Um, that's in contrast with Dewey Square, which is on the Greenway, 
which is really open to its surrounding city fabric. Um, it has a really large plaza, which is shown in white in the diagram on the left hand side. And that plaza is open to the streets. And so on big busy days, the streets can become an extension of the plaza. And the, and the square itself really focuses outward and provides a lot of opportunity for big events um, and outward facing visible kinds of events. You can see down in the pie chart there how much of that space is paved and then how much of space the space is lawn, but that lawn still is very open to the, to the city grid around it. Um, this also in the context of um, just looking a little bit beyond Boston, this is Bryant Park in New York City, which is um, a very famous city square, um, also adjacent to the public library in New York City. So a similar context to the one that we have here with Copley Square. Um, it's a much larger space. The Copley Square is about the same size as the interior lawn. Um, so it has a, you know, a number of paved spaces around it. It again has a wide variety of kinds of spaces that provide programming opportunities nestled under trees and sheltered from the street. Um, so it's a little bit more of an inward facing space that really balances green and paved areas for different kinds of programming. And finally, we also offer you um, the consideration of Pioneer Courthouse Square, which although very distant from us is a very similar size uh, to Copley Square and very, very paved. So this is a, a really important plaza in the heart of Portland, Oregon, where um, events like, um, like celebrations and protests really really come and activate the square at all times of days and nights. So it's um, a really active urban square, a little bit similar to Boston's own um, City Hall Plaza, but much smaller and sort of more intimate in the scale of Copley. So we have a number of questions for you here um, about how the vision, how your vision for the square should feel on the following sets of scales. Um, so on a scale of one to five, from lush and green and planted, to much more um, paved, where do you think the future of Copley should be? So I see a lot of people jumping right in to answer this and I see um, really the vast majority of people saying we should land somewhere right in the middle, which is actually very similar to the Copley that we have today. Um, as Kira mentioned, it's about half paved and half lawn space. Um, so people asking that that same balance be preserved in the future. Um, with a little bit of a skew towards lush and green and planted. So um, potentially reflecting sort of that canopy and the opportunities for some planting um, in addition to that overall balance of hard and soft space. So our next question for you is um, how should the square feel on this scale, a one to five again, from quiet and reflective and passive, a place where you might just go with a, a small group, um, to social and active and opportunities for really large groups and large gatherings. Um, knowing that the square will probably have some of each, which, which way should it trend? Which kind of activity should it support more? Um, so I definitely see a lot of folks in this category four asking the square to be a little bit more social and active and urban. Um, interesting, okay. Um, this is really helpful information for us. So, um, somewhere in the middle of paved and green um, and a little bit more social and active, um, but definitely people st still in the middle of that spectrum. Um, we have one final question for you in this section, um, and that is um, how the square should feel on this scale of in externally facing, really oriented to the street, think like Dewey Square, the example we showed you, versus inward facing, something that really looks inside itself, think a little bit more like Post Office Square or Bryant um, Park in New York City. Interesting. Okay, so a lot of people asking Copley Square to be a little more inward facing, which is potentially consistent with um, that direction to be about half um, paved and half green. Um, folks landing sort of in the middle of this one. Um, I think this brings up some interesting questions about how visible it is from the street, how it draws activity from the surrounding urban fabric. Um, and how much it shelters people and becomes a respite from that urban fabric. Um, so people really landing kind of all across the map here. And I see a lot of answers in this middle ground. Um, so I think this will be an interesting um, question for us to follow up with you all on during the discussion. Um, so this brings us to the end of our big analysis categories. Um, and I think we, we wanna share just really quickly high level next steps um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so 
Just to remind you all, uh, B shared this diagram at the very beginning of the presentation. This is our overall project schedule. Again, we're here in this first meeting at the end of our phase one, our site analysis phase, and we're here tonight to listen to you and to ensure that we hear everything that we really need to know from the community about how the square is used and what you imagine for its future. Um, we'll take all of that into consideration and it'll, it'll form the foundation for a number of conceptual ideas that we will bring back to you in the winter. Um, and so that will form the basis of our next meeting. Um, and from there, we'll refine into one and we'll check to make sure that we got that right based on your feedback from the second meeting. Um, and we'll bring that back to you in the spring. Um, so B is just going to um, transition here to tell us a little bit about how to engage with us over the course of the next 45 minutes. So we're going to open this up into our discussion question and answer session. And if you want to type it into the Q&A window, we can respond that way. You can also click the raise hand button and we can unmute you and let you go ahead and you can read your own question out loud. If you're calling us by phone, you press star nine to raise your hand. And then once we call on you, you press star six to unmute yourself. Um, in order to tell your friends and to do the survey yourself, which we're really hoping all of our attendees tonight will go to this survey. We've got HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash BIT dot ly forward slash copley dash survey um, there are more questions in this online survey than what we went through tonight and we're really interested in getting all of the information that you guys have that you want to share and you can forward that link as well to any of your friends and associates who want to be involved in our design process um, we also would love it if you could go to our website to basically keep track of the project this is where we're going to be posting the different meeting dates. We are going to be posting videos that, you know, from the previous meetings, any updates you can sign up to be on our, effectively our, ma our mailing list. Um, so if you could do that as well, that would be fantastic. That's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash BIT dot LY forward slash Copley dash Boston. Um, so before we get into the Q and A, um, we have, a number of electeds who are here tonight. I know that Kenzie Bach is here. And um, I think if Nora, if you want to unmute her, and then we can go on to any other electeds who are, who are here as well. Hi, thanks so much, B. Um, and thank you, thank you for having this. Um, thank you to everybody who's on the call. I, Copley Square is a completely, um, central and treasured space for so many of us. Um, it has been, been for me my whole life. I am a congregant at Trinity Church um, and a frequent user of the farmer's market and uh, the public library and everything that draws you to, um, you know, suggest to a friend to meet you in the square. Um, and so I'm really, I'm excited about the potential uh, for this project to really give some additional love and attention to the square. Um, and I think, you know, the people on this call are a testament to how, how much care there is for it. Um, and how many different communities uh, use it. And so uh, I, I, to me, there is no reason why Copley Square should not be competing um, with the, you know, the, the best European plazas that uh, we all share our photos of if, if we get a chance to go there um, or really any, any central square in the world. I think that, uh, I think of all of the, I, I'm biased, um, but of all of the kind of uh, central congregating spaces in Boston, I think in many ways it has one of the best opportunities to be that, to be a really organic gathering place in the heart of the city and not least because it's got one of the city's um, marquee civic institutions, the public library um, mm -hmm. right there anchoring a side of it. So um, I've, I've been in touch with the team extensively already. I have tried to pass on the sort of nitty gritty things that I hear from all of you about everything from, you know, how the fountain functions to, uh, you know, not wanting to break the stained glass uh, in Trinity with sound systems um, to uneven paving. So um, please do trust that throughout this process, if you if you bring those things to me, I'll be bringing them to the team. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited to be here tonight um, and excited about how we can, uh, how we can take the square in an imaginative um, direction that, that we all get to really appreciate for decades to come. So thanks again. Thank you, Kenzie.
Are there any other electeds who are here? You raise your hand, we will unmute you. No, okay. Um, I think we have a raised hand though from EB, if um, EB wants to um, ask their question. We'll unmute you now. Nora, are you able to unmute EB? <clears throat> so they're unmuted, but okay. they're not able to, um, it looks like they might be muted on their end. Okay. EB, if you're having trouble unmuting on your end, you can um, press Alt-A on your keyboard and that should unmute you if, if, if you're having trouble otherwise. While you troubleshoot, why don't we move on um, to uh, Yesian, who has her hand raised as well. I'm hearing clicking, but I don't. Okay, sorry. Yay. There we go. And we, okay. heard you, we heard you for a second, Jackie, but I think we lost you. Why don't we jump into some of the questions that are in the Q&A um, and those who had questions that you wanted to ask verbally, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A if we're having technical difficulties getting the mute unmute to work. Um, we can try to circle back to you um, directly again in a little bit. Um, I think there's a good question here for the Sasaki team about stormwater and how we'll be addressing stormwater within this project um, as we move further into the design process. Thanks, Liza. This is Zach here. I can jump in. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm a civil engineer at Sasaki and excited to be here. Uh, I saw that question from Paula, and I think it's a fantastic point that we're definitely going to be focusing on, which is how do we keep uh, Copley still functioning as a stormwater absorber uh, moving forward despite any surface changes, either more pervious or impervious? And uh, really setting that as a goal and a priority for the project to get that stormwater back into the ground and recharge groundwater. And so that's something we're going to be paying close attention to through any of the design schemes that we present to you in the next phase and looking forward to sharing those with you. Great, thanks Zach. Um, there is a question here about how people are getting to Copley. Do we have data that gives us an understanding of how people get to the square? Um, I don't know that we have collected anything like that yet, but I think I'll turn that over to the Sasaki team as well to find out if any of your observations have been informing that. Yeah, that's a great question, Liza. We, um, we don't have specific data on how people get to the square, only that it is a, a destination landscape for people from all over the city. Um, we have looked quite a bit at the, at the sort of pedestrian traffic patterns as well as the vehicular patterns that move people around the square. Um, so we know, we know that people arrive along Dartmouth, um, that's a, a major commuting route, um, as well as down the length of Boylston Street that those are the major routes. Um, Kira showed a diagram about how people move through the square. Um, we do not know whether people come to park their car um, and walk to the square or whether they are arriving at other destinations and happen upon the square. Um, that would be the, the purpose of another study. Um, but I think we, we're very interested in how they get into the square, um, those corners and the streets, um, and then um, how they move through the square um, and what their, what their patterns are through the square. So we've, we've definitely studied that. At length. There's a related question um, asking about, where did it just go? Um, 
about the traffic along Dartmouth Street. I don't know. I just lost track of it in my um, in my question list here. But oh, is there a possibility the traffic may be re rerouted on one side to provide additional quiet? So I interpreted that as Dartmouth Street, but it was not um, as explicit as that. Um, and I know that that's something that has been thought of um, across many different arenas. And I think the best answer for that at this point is um, that's an idea that can be explored. It's, there's, it's nothing that um, has been explored far enough to know if it's feasible yet. So it's definitely an interesting idea and something that um, we've all seen happen during major events at Copley, um, like the marathon where it's closed down um, for several weeks, but more study would need to go into um, the feasibility with traffic patterns and so forth before that could be advanced um, beyond just a temporary closure. I don't know if there's anything that anyone would want to add to that. Um, that was well said, Mike. Nice stuff. Thank you. Um, I think there's another interesting question here, um, also for the Sasaki team. How um, best can the iconic architecture be highlighted and central to the experience at Copley while still keeping it restful and interior feeling? Thanks, Liza. That's a great question. I think as a team, so far we're, we're still in an analysis phase. So we're looking at that architecture um, and, and getting really excited about the opportunities to have great views to the architecture and really highlight and frame those views with, um, with smart use of trees and other devices that really help um, reveal a really interesting and exciting viewpoint on the, on the city's architectural history. Um, this is something that we're gonna be exploring at length in the next phase of our work. Um, so from here, we're transitioning from analysis, understanding what views are important and which views should be highlighted into developing conceptual ideas that highlight different views in different ways um, and bringing those back to you as the community of um, users of the square to tell us what feels best. Um, so we'll be bringing you a number of different opportunities based on our understanding um, and ask you to help us determine um, how that architecture should be highlighted um, and which pieces should be most central to the experience. Great, thank you. Um, there's a lot of great questions here. I think there's a couple um, that are really about project duration and um, when construction would happen and how long that construction might take. And I mean, it's too soon for us to know the, the duration of construction, but B, would you wanna just give a sense of the overall um, project timeline, just for a reminder for anyone yeah. who um, may not have caught that? Sure, we're, we're really looking at focusing on developing the design and the construction documentation during basically throughout 2021. Um, and then construction would probably take about a year. Um, so that would probably be in 2022. I think the sort of question, one of the many questions would be, you know, what type of renovation are we talking about? Um, you know, complexity versus simplicity, something that would take a little bit longer. We're also talking about a city location. So it's gonna be a little bit harder to get to and would take a little bit longer than, you know, a park in the middle of a rural area. Um, but I think a year would sort of be a reasonable expectation at this point. Um, the only other consideration also would be the marathon. And if we were looking at trying to break ground in February or somewhere around when the marathon would start, we would wanna, pause and wait for that to happen and start after that so that we would try and create as little disruption as possible. Not just for the marathon, but for as many things as we can, but obviously we would need to start at some point. So. There's a really interesting question that just came in um, from Martin Roter um, about the impacts of COVID on the neighborhood, particularly you know, in, in two aspects with um, shopping, on Newbury Street really being impacted by the reduced foot traffic um, and also the reduction in um, office, you know, daily office users in the Back Bay because employers have their employees working remotely. Um, so how do, the question is how do we coordinate planning of Copley Square um, 
to try to secure a prosperous future for this neighborhood. Um, and I think I would turn that to Sasaki, see if you can um, give us some insights as to how we do that. And I'm happy to add some thoughts from a parks perspective. Eliza, that sounds great. And I think um, I'll, I'll open it to our entire team. But I, I think you know, this is a hot button question for all designers and activators of urban public space right now. Um, that big question of what, what comes next um, and how soon does um, our society kind of find a new e equilibrium um, and re-inhabit and reclaim public space um, without social distancing measures and other things that are really governing how we use space today. I think we've seen an incredible um, um, outpouring of love for public space in urban environments um, during COVID. Um, that these are places that have become places where we can see our friends and neighbors and meet people. And I think we will expect that Copley Square will continue that same function, um, people having an opportunity to meet and see each other um, outside um, and, and see friends and neighbors um, outside and, and that will continue. Um, to be a really important aspect of Copley Square. I think the question of how Copley Square encourages and, act, um, and has larger gatherings um, is really gonna be something that plays out over the course of this design process. We expect that the future of cities will have ur urban gatherings and celebrations and in protests um, in the future. Um, and it's a matter of ensuring that a design can be flexible to periods of social distancing and other pandemics and other things that will require um, distance among people, but also being flexible for the kinds of gatherings that do bring people together in a closer way and allows that flexibility for a wide variety of different scenarios in the future. Um, Liza, can you jump in or anyone else? From yeah, Sasaki? I was just going to add that I think, you know, we have these opportunities to rethink um, public spaces pretty rarely. Um, and, you know, it's been decades since we've, yeah. we've really worked at Copley in a substantive way. Um, and part of the opportunity that this project affords is the opportunity to connect with what's happening around the square. So what's happening at BPL, the projects that are underway there, and to really try to integrate this planning with the work that BPL is doing to engage other city departments in um, this project so that as um, the BPDA moves forward with, with planning work or development review, they have an understanding of what our hopes and goals are for the future of Copley. Similarly with um, transportation and public works, other, all, the, all the departments who are engaged in sort of making um, the city's public realm engaging and meaningful to Boston residents. So that's work where we are already beginning and will continue to do throughout the course of the project. There's a couple questions here um, that I was gonna maybe see if B will take. Um, one was about, well, there's two about how we're gonna be getting the word out on the survey. Um, if you wanna share some of our strategies um, with regard to you know, getting, getting the word out in general. Sure, so right now we're going to have it posted on our project page on our boston.gov website. And we have um, a steering committee of people who represent various concerns within the park that we are working with as well. And we have asked them to forward it out as well. And so that's a group of people um, representing homeless concerns, representing some of the arts, some of the business concerns, some of the neighborhood groups, um, a really sort of varied group that we're working with. Um, in addition to that, Sasaki is utilizing their sort of internal team to promote the survey as well. And we're really hoping that um, word of mouth from tonight will help expand as well because um, you know, we have it, I think we're also releasing it on our social media as well for parks. Um, we're, doing, we're doing as much as we can. And so um, if anyone can help tonight sort of further that, we always depend and really use the public in that regard, just to, to spread as much word as possible. And this is sort of a project scope question that maybe could be added um, to your response, B. There's a question um, from Jacob Wessel about programming and operational capacity and how and whether this project is um, just looking at capital improvements or whether we'll be sort of coupling that with um, 
looking at programming opportunities in Copley. Um, if that's something you want to take a stab at, we can also talk about it um, from the design perspective as well. I mean, I think as far as it, this has been a fantastic process so far, and I just feel like it's going to, you know, develop further and better in hearing of the different opportunities and ideas that people have as far as programming. And I know that um, Parks really wants to improve that and, and develop that. Um, as far as actually having that be part of this specific project, I think what, our, what we're sort of limited to is going to be, you know, creating a list of the ideas that we have been presented with and which we come up with during this project. But I know I think that there are different arms within the parks department that, that deal with sort of RFPs and contracts for that type of thing. So, um, you know, this is really what we're talking about tonight, while, while we embrace all ideas and we want to hear as many ideas as, as are out there, um, this is really a, a project about physical and capital improvements. So that is, um, I guess that's, that's the response as far as I'm concerned, but I guess if there are others on the panel. Sorry, I was just muted. Um, Sasaki, do you want to add anything to that in terms of how you approach programming and thinking about programming in design? Yeah, you know, I think that's an excellent question, Jacob. I'm really glad that you asked that. I think, um, you know, as designers of public space, we really try to maximize flexibility. Um, we can't control actually the, the programming um, that, as you mentioned, is usually, um, you know, a, a great partnership between, you know, a city agency and, and other um, interested parties. Um, and I think we, what we can do as designers is really um, help create an excellent platform um, that inspires that kind of investment um, by both um, the, the parks department um, and other interested parties who may jump in um, and be really interested in engaging and active, activating that space. Um, as B mentioned, there's a great steering committee involved in this project, um, full of folks who have a real vested interest in ensuring that Copley Square is an active and vibrant destination. Um, so we'll be providing a square that has great physical improvements that allows for sort of 21st century uses in a wide variety of ways. Um, and then really um, helping, helping to have that steering committee and parks um, have a great conversation about the future stewardship of that space and activation of that space. Thank you. Um, there was a question that came in right at the beginning of the presentation tonight that I hadn't circled back to yet. In part because I don't have a clear answer. Um, it was about, does the BAA pay for the sod replacement um, after the marathon? And my understanding is yes, um, but that's not my, uh, something I've worked on directly. So I, I, I say yes with a little bit of caution and I will double check that. And if there's anything that we need to correct, we can correct that um, at our next meeting to have some more clarity there. Um, but I didn't want to leave that unanswered even if uh, my answer is a little bit loose. There was a question um, a little bit earlier on also from James Berkman asking how can the separate zones of the square be harmonized and integrated? Which, you know, I think that's the design process, but if there's something that, um, that Sasaki you wanna, you know, talk about at this point, that would be great. You know, I, I think that's our question to you tonight. And I, I would actually put that question right back onto the community. We're hoping that some of the questions in our survey will help us tease out what you all think of that question. Um, Right now we've presented to you what the square is today, um, how it has a balance of a wide variety of different kinds of spaces. Um, and we're hoping that you'll tell us um, whether you like that balance, um, how it can be tweaked, how it can be radically reimagined. Um, and we'll take all of that into account as we pick up our pencils and begin to think about um, what the options are for the square. And again, we're gonna be coming back to you with a number of options. Um, and again, asking you what, where we got it right and where we, um, could improve. Um, so it, you'll have a lot of opportunities to help us shape that the answer to that question. The questions have started to dwindle down, but there's one here um, that we didn't answer earlier. Is there any data on how various ethnic or racial groups interact with Copley Square? Um, one piece of data that I, I can share is really just related to permits, um, which is it's not at all a full answer. It's one very narrow slice in how we understand who is um, 
utilizing the square, but when um, people apply for parks permits to use the space for an event or a gathering, we have information on um, you know, who they are, who their group is, what their event um, involves, and how many people are expected or anticipated to attend that event. So we share all permitted data, all, this, all that permit data with the design team um, so that they you know, can look back on that and, and see what kind of information is helpful for their process. That again, it's just one little blip. Um, the survey that's out does have um, some demographic questions as part of it. Um, so the more people who fill out the survey and the more widely that's shared, um, we'll be able to see sort of who's responded and if we're getting um, a reasonable diversity in the responses and whether that diversity is reflective of Boston or whether we're really just getting answers from a particular demographic which will be informative as the project moves forward. And speaking of the survey, I just noted that someone submitted a question about how long will this be posted? Um, and we're looking at three weeks. So if today is the 16th, we would probably take it down by, let's say like December 7th. Um, so if you can share that information, you know, share the link and as well, tell people to, to finish it as they're, you know, cleaning up with their Thanksgiving dinner or something like that, you know, just over the next few days when they have a break. Yeah, Liza, I would just add to that um, conversation that, you know, at, at Sasaki, we're a listening based practice and we're also a research based practice. And so we aren't coming with a preconceived notion about what's right for Boston or what's right for different demographic groups as they relate to the square. Um, but we're hoping to crowdsource that to hear from you as well as, as and, and all of the Boston community. Um, as well as rely a little bit on um, a, a group of researchers that we have in house that really focus on how to effectively um, design public space in a way that feels welcoming and inclusive to a wide variety of cultural groups and interests. Um, and so uh, we've been putting that into practice at City Hall. Um, Sasaki has got um, renovations to Boston City Hall Plaza underway. Um, it's something that we're really deeply interested in. Um, we're always learning. We don't have all the answers, but I think we're, we're curious about how to design space that feels welcoming um, to different cultural contexts, um, that has details as well as um, spaces that feel welcoming um, to a, the widest variety of people so that it can be an inclusive um, square for all of Boston. So we, we may not get that right, and we're curious to bring um, our designs back to you all and, and let you all um, tell us where, where we've gotten it right um, and, and how we can improve. One quick update, I um, got a message from my colleague Dottie Baxter, who's on the call tonight, and she confirmed that yes, the BAA does um, pay for the sod replacement after the marathon. So um, at least we have clarity there. So thank you, um, Dottie, for that, that update. We've answered all the questions that were in the Q&A, so I will turn it back to the team if there's anything else that you want to um, add to this discussion tonight for people to consider or put into the chat or anything like that while we're all still gathered. There are there are a number of um, things that brought up either pieces of other questions or things that were brought up in the chat having to do with the homeless population that's part of the square and we certainly recognize that it's a very prevalent um, population right now especially with um, the uses of public spaces um, being sort of varied with with COVID. Um, and so it's something that we we're certainly aware of and we want to, you know, design with with them in mind and, and not exclusive of them. Um, I think as a department, as an agency, you know, we're trying to create spaces that are enjoyed by people. And sometimes that means homeless and sometimes that means other citizens. Um, we're working with Trinity Church, obviously, because they're an abutter, but also because they have an outreach program. And we're also working with the Pine Street Inn. Um, both of them are members of our steering committee. And so, you know, we have our own sort of designs that, you know, we don't like to use benches that have too many armrests that make it impossible for someone to sit down and put their feet up. You know, we don't, we don't use those types of furnishings. Um, but you know, we want to include them in this discussion to, to notify us if there are things that, that we're missing out on that um, you know, we could 
we, we could make our design sort of inclusive to everybody because our stance is really not that we want everybody who is homeless to never come to Copley Square. It's that we want everyone else to come to Copley Square too. So you have a wide variety of users and a large mix of people. And that is really the mark of a successful public space. So I'm not sure if there are other topics within the chat or questions that people have either through the Q&A or if anyone else wants to raise their hand. Oh, I see a hand. I think Kenzie um, Buck. Hi, um, this is Kenzie. I just wanted to, I wanted to ask the team, um, it was sort of alluded to in passing, but I know, um, I know a few people have raised to me the sort of dream of, uh, you know, either closing or closing for sort of certain times a day or weekends or something like, um, just thinking about how to treat differently the Dartmouth Street stretch between the library um, and the square. And I think in particular, thinking about a world in which um, in which Copley sort of turns into, uh, you know, you can walk through the square and up the steps to the library. And uh, it's obviously a mode of, I referenced at the beginning, kind of a square interacting with a large civic building that we see successfully in a lot of other places. And it's certainly true on the other side with the religious institution at Trinity. Um, and I just wonder, I'm aware, I'm aware that I'm very aware as a city councilor that something like that I would be in extended conversation with you know, with transportation, planning, all kinds of, right, we'd really have to think about what the traffic impacts are, what you could or couldn't do, um, what it would look like to have kind of more pedestrianized pavers if you were gonna do it as part of the time or all the time. Um, so knowing that that's a kind of complicated question and also that um, we're talking here about a kind of visioning process, what, what is the degree to which that kind of idea will come into this process um, or can come into this process? That's a great question, Kenzie. And I guess I will jump in quickly just from a sort of project structure perspective. You know, we are working with BPDA and we've had some meetings with BTD just to discuss the, the options there. And at this point, it's really, it is an ongoing discussion. And obviously um, a test closure would have to occur at some point. Um, and so I think those those conversations are certainly happening, and I think it's pretty um, I think it's pretty apparent that there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of um, enthusiasm about that prospect, sort of opening up Dartmouth Street to pedestrians, perhaps exclusively. Um, so, you know, I think as far as our design goes, um, our scope limit as of now really is our sidewalk, um, and with further developments that that could change and i think what we're what we're talking about is you know creating a space that could work with a future design which incorporates a different pavement pattern a different layout you know what have you whatever could happen in that street bed um, but until we really know what the requirements would be of that space as far as emergency vehicle access all these details, you know, what that section looks like, what's underneath the roadbed, you know, what can you put there? We don't, we don't know. And as far as um, putting the brakes on, on our project in order to try and accommodate that, we're, our, our plan is as of now to design with that flexibility in mind. Um, so I don't know if anyone else wants yeah. to speak to that. Yeah, I would just add, um, there, as we mentioned in the beginning, there is a concurrent planning process for the Boston Public Library McKim Building, which includes the Dartmouth Street Plaza, which is a really generous sidewalk space and front steps of the McKim Building, which face Copley Square. Um, I've noticed several of the members of that design team on the call tonight, um, and we are actively collaborating with that team to ensure that the vision for the plaza in front of the McKim Building is, um, uh, it speaks the same language as the vision for Copley Square so that um, it provides the maximum opportunity for, um, for, for someday those places being um, actually connected via some closure of Dartmouth Street or experiment or temporal um, closure of that uh, um, space. Um, so there's an opportunity in the future to ensure that those spaces could be connected. 
Um, so the teams will work closely together throughout the planning process. That's a master plan, so it may not be implemented on the same timeline as be said. Um, we won't hold back renovations of Copley Square, um, but we will ensure that the vision for the two spaces is really united and could be united even further by um, opportunities along Dartmouth Street. Great. No, that's great to hear. I just think it, it is a rare opportunity to have even one of these planning processes and to be having two of them concurrently um, in a place that we all, you know, care about so much. I, I, I just really want to make sure that we're, that we are making that uh, connection. So thank you. Thank you. I see we have another hand up. Um, Elliot, Elliot, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment. Elliot Laffer, and I'm chair of the Neighborhood Association of Back Bay. Um, and just responding to the, the point that, uh, that Kenzie just brought up. Um, and the idea of a traffic-free Dartmouth Street on, on one hand uh, is very attractive with a huge butt. And the butt is the Dartmouth Street is how traffic from the turnpike gets to the Back Bay. And if traffic doesn't go down Dartmouth Street, it goes to Berkeley Street, and Berkeley Street is already terribly uh, overburdened with traffic, or it goes around the Prudential Center, which is a very, very difficult route. So um, it's a really, really serious uh, traffic concern to, um, to take that out. And I would, while, while I agree with the, with the idea of looking carefully at all the, the planning potential that we have there, um, this is a really hard call and needs really, really, really serious um, transportation and traffic analysis because I think you could plug the whole area if you take Dartmouth Street out of the, out of the, um, mm -hmm. out of the grid, at least during key times. Thank you, that's an important point. Anyone else have a question or a comment um, or a thought to share or something that you tried to ask and I missed it as I was going through questions um, or chats? Oh, here's something that I might have missed. Um, there was a, a question, has there ever been an idea of creating a permanent farmer's market um, with small covered booths like at Bryant? And I guess we have to think of that in the context. I don't. I can't speak to whether there's ever been that idea, but in the context of this planning process, um, since we're right at the beginning, um, it's great that you put that idea um, in the mix. And if there's anything that Sasaki wants to add to that, I think I think it's exciting to see that idea pop into the mix, and it's um, certainly a program element, like many others, that um, the design options will consider. Um, so. You may see um, that idea resurface when we come back to you in January um, or some idea like it. Thank you for raising it. Um, Catherine Peterson has uh, her hand raised. Catherine, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really want to thank um, uh, everyone for the incredibly thoughtful presentation and, and uh, um, great way in which you've engaged with us to get input. I was particularly uh, struck at the beginning by your reminder of Copley's history as an art square. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there are examples that you've seen that we can be thinking about of other urban spaces that are brought alive with art beyond the beautiful architecture that we've got um, at Copley Square? Are there models that we can be thinking about um, that have inspired you? Gosh, Catherine, that's an excellent question. Um, I think, you know, there are so many models of public art in public space. Um, and I think, you know, we actually have a few questions in the survey that point at this, um, whether you would like you know, whether the community would like to see the art and the sort of the way art is expressed in the square be looking back towards the square's history or more forward thinking um, about Boston and Back Bay's future. Um, so we're curious your opinions about that. Um, 
I don't have any examples tip of mind. I would say that, um, you know, public spaces around Boston are doing really exciting things with public art. Everything from the, you know, the, the giant inflatable bunnies that were on the lawn on D. Um, and so the sort of temporary activation with public art um, to the ideas around, you know, the Martin Luther King Memorial and other um, kind of exciting, more permanent pieces of art and reflection that the city is contemplating. I think um, there's, there's really a lot of exciting ways that um, the arts community can engage in the city. Um, the City Hall Plaza project is engaging the Percent for Arts program within the city of Boston. And so we're exploring ways to um, work with the Arts and Culture Commission um, and ensure that modern artists have an opportunity to make their mark on public space um, in, in both a permanent and a revolving way. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity for that same kind of civic expression and artistic expression to make its mark on, on the Copley um, moving, moving forward into the future. Just wanted to say again, thank you so much. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to really uh, make this one of the places that people really remember when they come and visit here and to see it differently um, when we come on a daily or weekly basis for those of us who live and work in the area. So thank you again. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you. We're right at the end of our, our time. Um, I don't know, Fee, you want to um, wrap things up? Yeah, well, I think, you know, as I've said probably 17 times already, please <laughs> take our survey and tell all of your friends about it and tell people who aren't your friends about it. Um, we have our, the, the link is right here on your screen. Um, so you can scan it on the QR code or just copy it down, take a photo with your phone. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody tonight for, for coming and, and participating. And, you know, we, we acknowledge that this is a strange format to go from the previous parks meetings that used to be live and in person and a very different type of interaction. This is something that we are all trying to get used to. And so we, we certainly thank you for, for bearing with us and the glitches that are involved. And um, it's just, it's great to hear and read all of your questions and, and I hope you continue thinking about this and I hope um, get in touch with me. You know, if you think of something after the meeting, send me an email and let me know. Um, I'd love to continue the conversation and we hope to see you at our next meeting. We're going to post when that is going to be the exact date on our project website. So please go back and check that. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks. Yeah, thanks everybody.